Now, getting back to email, for me, I did have a chance eventually to do medical research. When I went on to MIT, you know, email is not the only thing I did. I've done many things. One of the things I got heavily involved in was looking at how do you use computing to really solve the big challenges of medicine. What you're seeing here is in the U United States pharmaceutical problem right now, year over year, you see the left graph? We spend more and more on R&D. And you would think the more R&D you spend in innovation, you should get more results. But what you're seeing is less and less new drugs. So that's a problem I took on. In 2003, when I came back to MIT to do my PhD, this phenomenon was going on. And you can look at this graph very closely. You'll see that when the Human Genome Project started, the theory was that what made you and I different than a worm or a butterfly was the number of genes. So the Genome Project felt that we had about 200, 300,000 genes, and a worm had about 20,000 genes. But if you look at the end of the graph, when the Genome Project ends, it turns out we have the same number of genes as a worm. We have about 20,000 genes. So the entire area of biology recognized that you cannot consider the human being just as genes. The genes do not give rise immediately to disease. There could be other factors. Thoughts, maybe meditation can help, maybe food, et cetera. And this gave rise to systems biology. So when I came to MIT, one of the challenges was, could you create a mathematical model of the whole human cell? Could you create an infrastructure to do that? And to me, this was interesting. And to me, because of what I'd learned, ex inspired in India, I said, this is a way you can bring back holism to Western medicine. So I spent the next four years, and this was one of the first papers we wrote, that where we literally created this technology, which could take these molecular pathways, convert them to mathematical models, connect them together, and we created an infrastructure. So if email was electronic version of the office, Cytosol became the electronic version of the human cell. And what did we do? We published a lot of papers. Um, one of the big things that happened was Nature, again, that eminent magazine, wrote an interesting article saying the need for doing combinatorial therapy. You see, the ancient yogis of India, or sages of India, never gave just turmeric, right? They didn't just give one drug. If you look at our curries, they're a mixture. So Western medicine is finally realizing that you can't just give one drug. It causes side effects. You need to do combination. But it's very difficult to do it in the Western method. And we're the only ones in this paper cited as having the technology to do this. And this is not an inside job. We don't know the authors. So what that led me back was, could we use our technology to validate our ancient systems of medicine? And here's an example I'd like to get, tell you what we can do now. What you're seeing here, the outer circle is a cell wall. The inner circle is a nuclear wall. So you're simulating a cell. Every circle and square there is the molecules involved in inflammation. Today, we know most disease is caused by inflammation. And what you're seeing is curcumin. Anyone know what curcumin is? Well, you should. If you're in India, it's the active ingredient in manjul or haldi. OK? All over Asia, number one cause of uh, disease is liver disease, number one cause of death. Indians have one third less epidemiological issues because we eat quite a bit of curry. So what you're showing here is we've actually looked at 6,000 papers. We've modeled every molecular pathway where curcumin, curry, hits the molecular pathways of inflammation, and we've modeled it. Next, we can add resveratrol, which is the active ingredient in red wine. So imagine you're having your curry meal with red wine. We're modeling that. Now what we can do is we can literally, so on the right column, just look at where it says 0.15, the first row. We're modeling inflammation. So if you have 0.15, you have inflammation in your body. The next line is where we just give curry, curcumin. And you see the inflammation drops from 0.15 to 0.05. In the next thing, we just give resveratrol. It drops from, uh, we give five units, that drops to 0.06. But look what happens when you give curry and resveratrol together. This is called combination. And you see you get a 300% drop. This is what the ancient yogis of India knew. They knew you shouldn't take one drug. You should take a combination because they have a modulating effect. And that's the kind of stuff we're able to do. The more interesting thing that happened, and I'll wrap this up is shortly, is that we started using this, and we actually modeled pancreatic cancer. And I'm happy to tell you that we actually discovered a two-combination drug that does better than the modern drug, and we got FDA allowance to go to clinical trials without killing an animal. So the, and, and by the way, this is our company called Cytosolve. Um, and 
one of the areas that we're using Cytosol, everyone heard of GMO? Genetically modified organisms? Um, well, last year I saw this on the front page of MIT, which said, buy fresh, buy GMO. Right? MIT. It's not a question mark. This is saying that everyone in the world should adopt GMOs, particularly countries that need food. So I was a little bit shocked at this, and I found out that there's this pro and anti-GMO debate. And in fact, there's articles like this out there, people dancing around a beautiful GMO corn. But there's also the other side, which says GMOs could be a menace. And I, f I wanted to use science to find out, was there a middle ground? And the question is, what's the difference between a non-GMO and GMO? And what we did was, or what's the difference between David Banner and the Hulk? <laughs> Right? Now, what happens is that in 1976, President Ford, if you had a medical device, and it took many years to get this through the FDA, the issue was you made a small modification. Could you get this through the FDA faster? So Ford, in 1976, put this law in place, which let you say if it was substantially equivalent, right, if it had certain features. So what happened was um, people used that same law. Michael Taylor, who Obama appointed, to be the head of food administration, deputy commissioner, by the way, former head of science policy at Monsanto, gets appointed to become the lawmaker for the US government. And so he uses substantial equivalence. And this is the law. And if you read the law, it says that as long as the characteristics are the same. So what characteristics were they using? Touch, fel touch smell, taste. And does it have the same nutritional composition? So all these things were being allowed. So the key was the criteria. So what we did, did was we used Cytosol, we analyzed 11,000 papers, and we looked at soybean, GMO soybean. When they do the genetic insertion, and we looked across 6,000 experiments across 184 institutions in 23 countries, this is what we discovered. We discovered formaldehyde and glutathione. Formaldehyde is a toxin, glutathione is an antioxidant. We found out in GMOs, formaldehyde accumulates. By the way, this paper just came out seven days ago. So we're noticing a substantial difference. On the left side, you see a non-GMO. All plants create formaldehyde, but it's detoxified. In the GMO, formaldehyde accumulates. Then what you're noticing is, in the GMO, glutathione is used up. And in the non-GMO, it's stable. The bottom line is, we're noticing a significant difference. And this has not come out, because Monsanto, frankly, controls the entire discussion right now. So there is a big difference. Formaldehyde is different, and glutathione is different. Obama just put this out, calling for the need for transparency on this discussion. We'll see what's happening. So we're, we've said, let's use this technology to actually help understand what is substantial equivalence. And let me finish up with this. The reason I'm sharing the stories with you is, as entrepreneurs, what we do from the research to the lab can actually affect lives. The GMO debate is a significant one for India because the history of India is we never needed pesticides. We didn't need GMOs. The indigenous farming methods, according to all calculations, can create 5,000 calories for every person on this world. And there's a huge, huge, huge pressure to destroy the soil of India, and we must stop that. Let me finish up with this. And it's a very serious issue because you as entrepreneurs and we as entrepreneurs, we don't need to follow the Western models of success. That is not the Indian way. We don't need to repeat Western civilization, which is destroying the earth, which is doing unsustainable activities. The innovations that we need to create are the ones that go back to our forefathers who lived in absolute harmony with nature when you look at it. That's the kind of innovation. Those innovations came out from ordinary people. The last innovation I want to share with you is this is the way the Western world looks at medicine. You have genes, proteins, etc. This is the way the Eastern world looks at it. It's, I don't have time. There's a whole course I teach on this. But we have our own language, right? Purusha, Prakriti, Vata, Pitta, Kapha. The Western scientist doesn't understand these. They think these are just some snake oil. Well, I spent a lot of time understanding this. This was a front page of MIT where I won a Fulbright in 2007 to come to India before the incident with the Indian government. And what I discovered, this is a major paper I published, I'll send it to you, but I've discovered that the entire Eastern system of medicine, Voth, Pith, Kaf, directly correlate to Western control systems theory. And this paper is called the Rosetta Stone of Indian Medicine. It's out there, but you r literally realize, for those of your engineers, input, output, they match one to one. Karma is not a religious term, karma is action. 
I, I don't have enough time to discuss this, but the bottom line is we've made a breakthrough showing the ancient yogis and the language that they use matched one-to-one -one with Western control systems theory. So the yogis of India were looking at your body as a system, and they had a whole language. They weren't looking at it as molecules. So what we've done is we've taken that, we've actually created an app online where it asks you a set of questions and it helps you determine your system state, which is a red dot. It asks you another set of questions and you could integrate other medical information. The black dot is your deviation, that's called your vikriti. So every body in this room has a certain red dot and your deviation is from that. And based on that, the system does what my grandmother would do, okay? And it prescribes you different, different things that are right for you and then it sends you an email every day. Anyway, the net of what I want, and by the way, we made this into another company called Systems Health, which is an education company, and the app we just give away to everyone. We want to radically change Western medicine. I want to end on this. Everyone heard the term entrepreneur, right? Where does it come from? Well, most people will tell you it comes from French, 1852, entrepreneur. But there's another older term, entrepreneur. Okay, which is 1,000 year BC, 3,000 years ago, and it actually means driven by insight. And what does this say? If you look at the ancient teachings in Upanishads, it says you are what your deep driving desire is. As your desire is, so is your will. As your will is, so is your deed. As your deed is, so is your destiny. That's what it means to be an entrepreneur. And as I end this talk, I want, you know, I've been in both worlds, but India, the, you know, entrepreneur India coming to India, I think we have a whole new way to define what it means to be an entrepreneur, define what it means to be success, and it's about going inside ourselves, finding the truth from within. We don't have to follow all these metrics that are put, imposed on by the Western world, because frankly, if you think corruption in India is anything, the corrupt politicians in India are babies compared to the politicians of the United States. And we do not, must not follow the Western model. It is going to destroy India. And the entrepreneurs in this room and entrepreneur India and the organizers who have done this have done a great service because we have an opportunity to do a completely different inflection point and actually put India as a leadership of what it means to be a great entrepreneur. Thank you.